Hello and welcome back to our watchmaking road trip adventure as the serious stuff is about to begin today. In our last episode, you got to meet the guys that came to Geneva and totally trusted us as they had no clue what program we had planned for them. So to set the scene of this road trip and give them some perspective on the rich history of watchmaking, well, we had to start by visiting the most amazing watchmaking collection in the world open to the public. And you guessed it, this is the Patek Philippe Museum, found in the very heart of Geneva. But before getting there, it was time for our guys to get ready early morning, maybe too early for some. I'll be there in two minutes. And discover our sweet pride, the 1967 Volkswagen T1 bus in its very Swiss red and white library. For the little story, this bus is in its original condition, no restoration whatsoever, but it belonged for many years to the same Swiss-German family. And this gives you an idea of their seriousness in terms of keeping stuff working. So off we go through the city of Geneva for the first short leg of our journey, direction the Patek Philippe Museum. We have the museum for ourselves. No way. No one else. So enjoy. <laughs> I thought it was incredible to be able to have the museum to ourselves, uh, especially on, on, on a Monday when it's, it's usually closed. And then to have a tour where nobody else was around was, was a real privilege. We were greeted by the museum's curator, who briefly explained us the history of the museum, which today hosts an outstanding 4,000 timepieces in its walls. This museum is in fact the private collection of the Patek Philippe owners, and it was Philip Stern that decided in the late 90s to gather his collection in a building built in the early 20th century, which had been used for various watchmaking manufacturing activities before this transformation. I thought that the, uh, that the watches in there were owned by the company, Patek Philippe. And then when I realized that it was owned by the Stern family itself, that was intimidating. 4,000 watches owned by a couple of people. That was, that was amazing. I never knew this existed. The amount of history, the amount of complications, the amount of just art in there was overwhelming. Well, it's, it's been fantastic. Um, I didn't know what to expect. It was, uh, it was a bit scary buying a ticket, flying to Switzerland, not knowing what I was getting myself into, but uh, it's, been, it's been excellent. It's been beyond what I could have imagined. I hoped that we would go to the museum, definitely, uh, and it was the first thing we did. You have no That's idea. Fantastic. So off we went for this very exclusive private guided tour. The museum is set on four floors. The ground floor displays tools and other pieces of machinery used by watchmakers, and they are all operational, as it is not unusual that watchmakers still rely on these machines today to perform some specific tasks. On the same floor, you will also find an actual watchmaker dedicated to the restoration of some of the timepieces found in the museum. So in a certain way, the man here is part of the show, but he's truly working on pieces found in this museum. The top floor is dedicated to a huge library put together over time. There is a bit of memorabilia present here, some family souvenirs. But now let's go down to the second floor, which presents an unbelievable collection of antique timepieces, ranging back to the very early stages of mechanical watchmaking some 500 years ago. You can look at some of those um, movements and believe, and believe they've would been made in the last 20 years. They're, they're quite astounding. That was made in 1790. It's amazing. There were things in there that I, I just didn't know existed. Um, a couple of things that I really enjoyed were the sort of Art Deco ones and the pistols as well with the automator. How do you say it? Automator? Automata. Automata, yeah, the, the birds. They were something I didn't know existed. Well, there was this one Breguet piece where it's a clock and you put the pocket watch on top of it and it first looks like, you know, just a place where you put your pocket watch and then you realize that the clock itself winds and sets that pocket watch. Do you realize what I just said? Just drop a pocket watch on a clock and it does everything itself and that was made by Breguet himself? It's, it's indescribable. The amount of technique and innovation that was put into that piece is just overwhelming. It's, it's, it's awesome. 
really the most remarkable one, I think, wasn't from the 1500s, but it was, it was a, a watch made out of wood. The whole mechanism was made out of wood. I didn't know that that was possible, but um, it just goes to show you that always something will surprise you, even if it's from centuries before you existed. These two pistols are called Amorous Jewel, a sentimental jewel. There's no bullet inside, flower opens, yeah. and it was perfume. The guide was like a living history book. He was uh, incredibly knowledgeable, friendly, approachable. Seeing all these watches, seeing all this history, all this art, all this innovation in one location, this was a dream come true. My first impression was, I guess, overwhelmed by uh, the history behind it. And uh, one thing that impressed me a lot was the, uh, the archives that they've kept for so long. 1806. This is a very important dimension of this museum. It's rich, eclectic, and simply fascinating as it focuses on the complete history of watchmaking and not only Patek Philippe timepieces, but we'll get there soon. Realizing and understanding that all these complications were done by hand hundreds of years ago really lets you appreciate what these watchmakers were doing back then without electricity, without CNC's, without AutoCAD. These people were, were, were geniuses, you know, to say the least. You know what worries me sometimes? We aren't doing enough with what we have. Yeah. These people back then, they did more with what they had, they had everything. They did it without computers, without technology, without a light bulb. They, they depended on the sun and they tried their best to get sunlight during the day, but once the sunlight went away, it was done. And obviously they had more time on their hands, there were less distractions, but society was also working against them. So the fact that they could, you know, they could grow their food, they could sustain a, a simpler society without the conveniences that we have today and still dedicate the time, the effort, and the, really the, the passion for, for this micro-engineering feat and to count their time. It's, it's remarkable. So now we went down to the first floor, which precisely focuses on the Patek Philippe history, a brand that just celebrated its 175th anniversary in 2014. For these kinds of commemoration, and some of you may know this, but the brand always comes out with a very special timepiece, and as you can expect, it's always a fine showcase of its watchmaking skills, displaying obviously incredible technical expertise and creativeness. In 1989, for the brand 150th anniversary, Patek introduced what was the most complicated watch ever produced at the time, the Caliber 89, with its 33 complications and 1,728 components, which can be seen here in an original sectional view, and only four models were ever produced. I've never seen so many. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> this floor will drive any Patek Philippe enthusiast completely mad as it gathers hundreds of exceptional timepieces and displays the rich history of the brand, which was from day one focused on the production of super high-end watches. You know, the reason why we love them is we can't afford them. Customers of the time represented mainly the super affluent society, in particular royal families throughout Europe, but the brand soon started to be represented internationally on other continents. And for instance, it made an early partnership with the US-based jewelry house Tiffany & Co, a collaboration that is still ongoing today. Patek Philippe has always been driven by innovation, contributed to some important research and development in the field of watchmaking. For instance, with the development of quartz watches, yes, you heard me right, we often think of Patek solely focused on mechanical watches, but uh, this has not prevented them to explore new territories, as quartz movements were actually developed in Switzerland, but the technology was successfully implemented on an industrial scale, mainly by Japanese watchmakers in the 70s, to the great demise of the Swiss watchmaking industry in the years that followed. Despite having already more than 4,000 timepieces present in this museum, this collection is continuously being given more substance, with the addition of exceptional timepieces bought in different auctions and other private means of acquisition. None of what we saw in the museum from any point in time was just purely practical. There was no uh, pure just function above all else. It was function with decoration, with, with elegance, with, uh, with style. Everyone centuries before they still had style and they wanted people to see their, their style in their work and that's something that I, I respect and I, it's, it's fantastic. The enamel, superb, superb.
So now, having seen all this watchmaking patrimony, it is time for the lads to continue the adventure and this time we are heading to today's Patek Philippe manufacturer in Blolywatt, just on the outskirts of the city of Geneva. You probably all have heard the company's slogan on the fact that you will never really own a Patek Philippe watch, but actually looking after it before passing it on to the next generation. Okay, so this may sound like a lovely marketing speech, but to carry this in real life means to have a pretty well-armed service center, and this is what we're about to discover. What happens to your Patek Philippe watch in its lifetime. So see you for our next episode of our watchmaking road trip. All the best, see you soon. Tech models. Don't, don't tell anyone. This is where they throw all the bad techs. Very old models. <laughs> <laughs>